I see a very dependent communities. I see a group of people who are dependent on government. And it tore my community apart and it put it back together. We have outgrown the Indian Act. It's a very paternalistic document. I don't think we can get improved community conditions under the Indian Act. It's going to take a treaty to give us the best set of tools to move beyond our current socioeconomic conditions. We've regained the right to govern ourselves. In 2000, the final agreement between the Nishka, Canada and British Columbia came into effect and became the first modern treaty signed in British Columbia. In 2003, four BC communities, the Klekle Tene, Sliaman, Malnuth and Tawasan First Nations ratified agreements in principle after 10 years of negotiations. Treaty negotiations are complex, and the leaders of these communities see the value in sharing their experiences. At this time, I'd like to call on the president of the Nisqat Nation, Dr. Gosnell, to make some more presentations on behalf of the Nisqat. Thank you, Kevin. I have the distinct... We've regained the right to govern ourselves. We've thrown out uh, the Department of Indian Affairs. We've thrown out the Indian Act. Uh, we no longer have to seek the advice or the consent of the Minister of Indian Affairs. Anything that we do in the Valley today is done in the Valley for the benefit of our people. We no longer have to go to Ottawa to do that, come to Vancouver to seek the input of a region. It's gone, gone forever. Indian Act's gone forever. We're, we're in control of our, I think we're in control of our destiny, really. There's a need to develop a relationship of the table of trust and respect between the federal government, the First Nation, and the uh, provincial government. There have been, uh, bad relationships that uh, have existed for one reason or another in the past and we have to get over uh, some of that history. Uh, the First Nation, as I talked about, needing to develop a, a vision. Canada and British Columbia need to develop policies in, within their own systems that they can bring to the table that are acceptable to uh, First Nations. We're fundamentally changing the relationship between First Nations, Canada and British Columbia and that takes a long time. Well, I guess one of the things that, that, I, that I see in a post-treaty environment is what I don't see in today's world. I see a very dependent communities. I see a group of people who are dependent on government. Uh, and, and I'm not painting it with a paintbrush here. Like there's different kinds of people. But when you look at the statistics, a large portion of all Aboriginal communities in Canada are dependent on government. What we're facing now as a community, socioeconomic conditions, um, poverty, poor health, is unacceptable, totally unacceptable. And uh, that's what I remember when I'm at that table, is that I'm representing a community that um, should be in a lot better place than, than they are. Because of this Indian Act, we've got somebody to blame for anything that goes wrong. And uh, in a, in a post-treaty environment, obviously you don't, you can't blame anybody because you're going to be, you're using your own constitution as the basis of your government, and therefore you only have yourself to blame. So I see that being very, very, very different. And so my, you know, what I see, you know, 20, 30 years in terms of a post-treaty environment is these very independent communities, and they're they're going to have problems just just like everybody else, but they're going to be in control of their own communities. There's several reasons that, that the community has selected to negotiate a treaty. First and foremost, we feel that it will clearly define our relationship with other governments. 
Secondly, it will provide us the tools to achieve our goals and objectives for our community members now and into the future. As chief, my vision for my community is economic, social and cultural sustainability, um, comparable socioeconomic rates to what people enjoy off-reserve, uh, those sorts of things. We, uh, uh, there's a huge disparity right now between the income of a Tuasan family and a non-Aboriginal family less than a kilometre away, uh, so I want to see that change. I don't think we can get um, improved community conditions under the Indian Act. I don't think we can necessarily get it through litigating these issues. I think that negotiation is a practical way of advancing our interests as a community without losing, um, without losing our identity or without giving up anything. Uh, we uh, as Tawasan people can aspire to anything we want to be and work within the context of Canada with uh, the federal government, the provincial government and municipal governments and we're not giving up anything to do that. I, I fully believe that um, it's the best way to have a meaningful, positive impact to the quality of life of members of my community. And that's why I've dedicated, you know, the past 13 years of my life towards that. The biggest challenge is to involve your community, is to, is to try and make sure that they take ownership of it. You know, we, we fell into a trap as Indian people in that we would send our leaders away to do everything and then blame them. And, and so that became a way of life for us. And so in, it's been one of the struggles in, in the communities is to say, hey, just hang on a second. This is your future. You have got to take ownership of where we're going to go with it. You can't just give it to somebody else and then, and then blame them later on for it. So you've got to be a part of it. It was a long, hard process. It's a process that took a lot out of my community. In my opinion, it tore my community apart and it put it back together. We have uh, experienced frustration, challenge, jubilation. Um, so over the period of, of nine years in which we've been negotiating, it, it has been uh, um, very emotional for myself and our community. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to start something new. But you owe it in the best interest of future generations to explore opportunities. Don't close the door. From the perspective of the Slyman people, we didn't make a mistake in negotiating a treaty. Uh, Slyman took a very courageous and brave step on October the 4th, 2003 and ratified an agreement in principle. It's a document that doesn't mean anything. The final agreement will mean something, so it's important to clarify that at the beginning. First of all, you should destroy the myth that treaty is going to be the be-all, end-all. It isn't. All it is is it's part of the answer, it's part of the puzzle, and it's a big part because it, it leads to a lot, a lot larger land base and, and it leads to governance, which, which isn't here now. So those are two big components. But there's a lot of other things that have to happen along with treaty. And I would say that one of the biggest things is the education of our people. Uh, we need to keep on pushing and keep on, even though it's getting better each year, we need to keep the pressure on and make sure that our people realize the, the importance of education. <laughs> I think the largest uh, challenge that our community members faced was understanding the issues and for us to explain the issues in a manner that it would make it more understandable for them to provide the necessary input and have the understanding so they, they can make informed decisions. I found that as treaty negotiations are progressing and we've moved beyond process and are getting into substance, uh, instead of talking about how often we're going to meet and what sort of meetings we're going to have, we're now talking about land and cash and fish. So people have really taken uh, more of an interest in what's going on in negotiations. Uh, 
sort of, uh, there was some degree of apathy before. And I guess, as I said earlier, there's some degree of fear of change, which is, is human nature. But it really allows us to assess who we are as a community and what our aspirations are. Um, so these discussions uh, are forcing us to have that conversation as a community. And uh, ultimately that's a positive thing uh, because now we know where we will have to head to as a, as a community with or without treaty negotiations. I, I believe uh, there, there already have been some positive effects with, with our community in regards to uh, uh, treaty negotiations. Just, just by virtue of the approach we have taken, the community members have, have come together and have discussed uh, a lot of issues and have learned to work together. And I believe there's a new appreciation for, for each other in working through them processes. You do things a little bit at a time. I, I find it unacceptable to just throw big, large chunks at our people and say, here, absorb this. You know, I think you deal with small concepts, small issues, deal with them one step at a time, and, and make sure that your people understand it before you move on to the next thing. We felt it was important to seek out advice and experiences of other First Nations. And we were fortunate enough to establish a protocol of communication and, and information sharing with the, the NISCA. So they allowed us early access to a lot of their information. We've met with them many, many times over the years and, and uh, they've provided us freely with advice and, and openness. Our society would be in touch with other organizations that, that managed a treaty negotiation for other First Nations. We're very good at networking. Uh, well, I think we understand the challenges that face us. Benefits, in my opinion, aren't directly attributable to the treaty, but they're attributable to the treaty process and that it's made the communities come together more They've put, put aside some of their differences. I see hope in some of our communities now that wasn't there, you know, five years ago. I see a, um, um, an excitement amongst young people that they're going to be a part of another world, not the one that, that they saw in the, in the past, and they're excited about it, and they're, and they're asking themselves, what role am I going to play in this new world of ours? And so when you talk about, you know, a huge land expansion, you talk about new powers, uh, talk about governing yourself and that. There's excitement in our communities. I've also found that um, now that we are in more advanced dis discussions of treaty negotiations, there's a great deal of uh, increased credibility. People view my community a little bit differently than they did a year ago, and um, that's a positive benefit. Uh, I think uh, also, uh, as time goes on, there is more awareness of Tawasan issues publicly within our community and uh, with governments as well. So, so that's a positive impact of treaty negotiations. It will affect in a significant way each and every community member. As the Slavin First Nation asserts its title, um, leverages a position, accesses opportunity, negotiates a final agreement, there will be opportunity on the table. Um, whereas at the moment there's, there is opportunity but it's always been at a very stagnant level. Uh, we need to get to a level where it starts exciting community members and there will, I think in a nutshell, there will be more opportunity. I guess the benefits from uh, an economic standpoint, there, there has been some positive results over the, the last few years. Um, we have secured funding through the treaty to allow us to investigate business opportunities, uh, provide us uh, the ability to analyze uh, portions of land that we are interested in so we don't have to make an uninformed decision. 
Uh, it has provided us with the ability to uh, do some planning for the future. So there have been some uh, positive aspects to the negotiations. If we can't get it through treaty, uh, we still know what sort of land base we're going to need to meet our economic aspirations, our housing aspirations, that sort of thing. So uh, internal um, sort of uh, benchmarks, if you will, of knowing where we want to head to as a community. Our strategy in regards to gathering information has been that, uh, like preparing for a court case. And if the treaty negotiations never do uh, come to fruition, the information that th we've secured in the process is that we've secured the information will be helpful in potential legal challenges down the road. Another type of capacity that has developed would be the political capacity. It's forced our community to look at a very important question before the community and it, it's, it's made people aware that it was a very important question and it forced them to get information. I think that information is really important for First Nations to, to know simply because uh, you know they're always talking about legal challenges and, and that's one of the big decisions that a community has to make is whether they, they legally challenge or they negotiate to the treaty process. There's been an ongoing uh, movement in all the communities in terms of building capacity. Again, what treaty has done is it's intensified that capacity building. And so now you see a lot more people dealing with, for instance, like forest resources and developing the capacity to deal with forest resources because instead of talking about a 500 acre uh, uh, reserve land, now we're talking 10,000 hectares and managing 10,000 hectares. And that demands a whole new group of people to do that. And so a lot of our young people now are starting to develop capacity in those areas. We've had the Indian Act for about 150 years and I think that's long enough to see what could do, what it couldn't do, and I think it's hurt my people more than it's helped the Slyman people. We've lost opportunity. It's slowed us down. We can access more opportunity through a final agreement than well, a piece of legislation like the Indian Act. I would simply say get involved. The question is very important. It's a question that'll impact. If I were to approach the average community member who likely wasn't very informed at the start of a process they won't be, I would say get informed. I would urge people to speak up, even if they have to just tell a friend and ask their friend to say it for them. I would urge them to speak up because my experience is, is that every human being, in my opinion, has an opinion that's worth something. First of all, do your constitution. Because when you get, when you start getting deep into the treaty process, most of the questions that people ask are actually they have the answers to them and nobody else can have the answers to them. Like for instance, they'll say, well, how are we going to elect our leader? Well, the answer to that is it's going to be in your constitution. Well, what is your constitution going to say? It's going to be whatever the community supports because the constitution has got to be voted on by the membership. So I say develop your constitution and then everybody will have ownership of it, they will know exactly what their government's going to look like, they'll know how, who's eligible to vote and everything like that. All those questions will be answered. That was the advice of our elders. He said, we're sending you into the room to negotiate on our behalf, on behalf of the Nishka Nation. You will sit at that table and remain there until you have reached an agreement that you can bring back to the nation and the nation will make a decision as to whether or not they feel that uh, what you have done is sufficient for the future generation of our nation. It, it's important for, for other First Nations to, to recognize that the First Nations that are negotiating a treaty are negotiating a treaty for themselves. The treaty will provide tools for us to rebuild our community. Um, it's not utopia with a bow, it's, it's the toolbox to 
rebuild our community to a former um, level of wealth. Uh, we were traditionally wealthy as Coast Salish people and uh, we want to reinstate that and not just economic wealth but all aspects of our culture and uh, socially uh, as well as economically. So a treaty uh, will sort of provide us the autonomy to, to get on with rebuilding our community, I think. A treaty isn't about 100% of the territory or lock, stock and barrel. A treaty is about sharing. The people of Paul River aren't going away. The people of Slime and will be here forever. And it's a, it's a matter of using the lands and the resources that are rich to the benefit of the people in the region, not the provincial government or the federal government. Too many people in Slime have died poor in a rich land that has to stop and more people will die poor but I think we've started a process that will correct that. You're in negotiations for the long haul. There are no shortcuts. It's going to take your complete dedication and commitment to carry out what is in the best interest of your nation.